Chicago and the, yeah, the talk is going to be about black holes cannot be overspun or overcharged. So please share your screen if uh, yeah. so that we can see your slides. Right. Okay, yeah, now okay. we can see them. Is that working? Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay, so I want to tell you about some work uh, that I did with uh, John Source uh, several years ago. I guess at the time, uh, John was an undergraduate at uh, Chicago. He's now a graduate student at Stanford. And uh, here are the references for all the details, uh, you know, that not all of which I'll be able to give in this uh, talk. Um, so as I think probably everyone in the audience is aware, we have a, if we include electric charge, a three parameter family of Einstein Maxwell black holes in general relativity. Uh, they are known to be the only stationary black hole solutions. And therefore, if uh, cosmic censorship is true and gravitational collapse always results in a black hole, uh, that's what you always have to have for some value of these three parameters. But these uh, solutions, they exist for all values of the parameters, but they only describe black holes well, when the mass is positive and the mass squared uh, satisfies this relation relative to the angular momentum uh, and the charge. So a kind of really cheap idea for testing cosmic censorship, I mean, and putting it to a non-trivial test would be to drop some matter into a black hole. So if you started with an extremal black hole that satisfied this equality exactly to begin with, or as what I'll spend most of the uh, talk on is the case where it's slightly non-extremal. That may sound a little strange to try that, but I'll explain why. If I can drop into the black hole something that has more angular momentum and charge than energy, uh, I might be able to violate this inequality. And that would be, as I say, an incredibly cheap disproof of cosmic censorship. OK, well, uh, that's something Well, that, in particular, I looked at a long time ago. Uh, I imagine dropping particles into or throwing particles whatever you want to do, but particles uh, on extremal black holes. And I showed that you just, this just barely didn't work. You could, if you had a particle whose energy, angular momentum and charge would bring you beyond this uh, equality into the naked singularity regime, then that particle wouldn't go into the black hole. And I thought that was the end of that story. And now we have to do hard work to you know, prove cosmic censorship. Um, so let me just show you how that works. I mean, the, the simplest case to consider is uh, uh, the uh, Reissner Nordstrom case. I mean, things work uh, completely similarly in the spinning case, but this is easier to think about. So let's... Uh, see if, if I start with an extremal Reissner Nordstrom, whether I can drop something in, drop a particle in uh, that will make the charge of the black hole bigger than its mass. Well, the energy of a particle is given by this expression. This quantity, the you know, four velocity dotted into the killing field, uh, the, this is the time-like uh, killing field, but that becomes null on the horizon. But nevertheless, this inner product in my metric signature conventions is always uh, non-positive. So with the minus sign, this always contributes something positive. Uh, this term gives you Q times the uh, potential at the horizon. 
For a Reissner Nordstrom black hole, that's given by uh, this expression. But for an extremal Reissner Nordstrom black hole where m equals q, uh, this potential is just one. But that's telling you then that uh, E, the energy that the particle has, which is going to what's going to contribute to the increase in mass of the black hole, uh, is always bigger. <coughs> excuse me, is always bigger than uh, Q. But that's saying that delta M is always bigger than delta Q. You can understand this if I have a particle. Uh, you know, that I want to drop in at rest. I mean, this ties in with what Eric was just saying at the uh, near the end of his uh, talk. If I make the charge to mass ratio of that particle uh, bigger than one, where, where I have an extremal uh, black hole there, then the Coulomb repulsion is going to dominate over the gravitational attraction and it won't uh, go in. Well, I can throw it in then. Uh, I'd want to throw it in in such a way that it was very near a turning point when it entered the, the black hole. But then the, this calculation exactly shows I'm going to have to give it, you know, an energy that is bigger than delta Q. So you can't get any violation and cosmic censorship looks completely safe, at least as far as this trick for violating it. Well, that isn't or wasn't the end of the story, and it, that isn't the end of my uh, uh, talk this morning uh, because of ideas that were, uh, well, begun by Hubni about 20 years ago and over 20 years ago, and then uh, pursued by a number of other people. So uh, it's convenient to introduce this parameter epsilon that's measuring how much you're deviating from an extreme, let's just stick with Reissner Nordstrom, and we'll go to the general Kerr case uh, when we do the general analysis, but just let's uh, look at this. So uh, if I just define this parameter epsilon, the key fact is that the difference between M and Q is of order epsilon squared in this parameter, but the difference of the potential from one, remember the potential of one prevented us from doing anything bad to the black hole. Well, the potential drops from one, but it drops by order epsilon. So if you took that linear order calculation uh, that I just described, you know, over on these view graphs, I won't go through that, if you put in this value of phi h and realize that this is all you have to do and you only have to get a little tiny uh, bit of extra charge in compared to that, uh, um, well, this is the same calculation with the one replaced by one minus epsilon. And it looks like if you put in a charge of epsilon m over two. So this is still a tiny charge. It's sort of still a test charge. So that's OK. Uh, you know, we're not into a highly nonlinear regime where we can't do any analysis uh, at all. Uh, it looks like we ought to be able to uh, uh, violate cosmic censorship. Now, that's a little little funny sounding, uh, uh, you know, it's sort of saying, well, if, you, if you're at the edge of a cliff and you stand exactly at the edge of the cliff, you can't jump off. But if you get a little bit of a running start, uh, you know, then you might be able to jump off. But, okay, well, the problem with this argument though, is that the violation is occurring at order Q squared. Uh, in this uh, example. So you really, I mean, effects that are of order Q squared can contribute and you really need to calculate all the corrections in particular to the energy that goes into the black hole at 
order Q squared. And in order Q squared, there'll be self force effects. There'll also be finite size effects. Uh, and you'd have to calculate this. But if you, you know, try to, I mean, self force effects in particular, uh, well, have been uh, calculated, but if you're trying to con compute self consistent motion, uh, to see whether the particle goes in, that's really beyond, certainly beyond what people can do analytically. There have been, there were some numerical investigations of whether violating type particles would actually go into the black hole uh, that indicated they probably wouldn't, but, uh, you know, were not conclusive. So what we're doing, uh, or what we did, um, which I'll tell you about for the rest of the talk is, uh, well, different from what I've just been describing in a number of ways. So it's worth it to highlight that. So uh, we're not gonna consider particle matter, but, uh, but arbitrary continuum matter. So that's really a significant generalization because particles really are, you know, little blobs of continuum matter anyway. So if we can treat arbitrary continuum matter, that's even better. And the only thing that we'll, we need to assume about the continuum matter is that the non-electromagnetic contribution to the stress energy satisfies the null energy condition. Well, the electromagnetic contribution automatically satisfies the null energy condition. Uh, so the total will, but we have to assume that separately the uh, the non-electromagnetic part uh, will go in. Then we'll uh, satisfy this null energy condition, sorry. Uh, then it is really not that easy to figure out when you're you know, working to second order in charge and mass and so on, what will and what won't go into the black hole. So we just assume that you have matter that does go into the black hole and we calculate the effect of that matter on the mass, angle, momentum, and charge of the black hole. So that's a big simplification that we don't have to start uh, you know, computing orbits. And then uh, as you'll see, we get an exact expression uh, you know, in terms of integral formulas at least, uh, for the full second order effect on of the matter going in uh, to the black hole on its mass. And then that will allow us to derive a bound on the second order change of mass, uh, which we'll see will be sufficient to avoid a, a terrible fate for uh, black holes. But we don't by doing it this way, we don't have to calculate self force effects, finite size effects, or anything else separately. That's all included in this uh, bound that we get on the second order change of mass. Okay, so to do this, we have to bring out a, a quite a bit of machinery that uh, you know has been used for uh, other purposes, I mean, uh, you know, black hole thermodynamics and black hole stability in particular, but uh, that machinery is there and available for use, and it turns out to be just what we needed to get the results that we want. So the machinery all has to do with, well, is derived directly from properties that stem from the Lagrangian formula, formulation of general relativity, or in this case, Einstein-Maxwell theory, uh, and the diffeomorphism covariance of the, of the theory. So that's really what uh, the arguments are based on. So I've written the Einstein, uh, Hilbert, and Maxwell Lagrangian. So this is the Lagrangian of Einstein-Maxwell theory, you may notice that I'm writing it as a four form here, which is ready to be integrated uh, to get an action rather than sticking in a square root of minus G and 
thinking of this as a scalar, this uh, uh, four form is a much easier way of thinking about it and doing the manipulations. Usually what you do with Lagrangians is derive the Euler-Lagrange equations. Usually put the, people put things under an integral sign that's very distracting and very, I mean, leads you down bad paths of looking for boundary terms and things like that. We don't need any of that. I'm just gonna vary the Lagrangian and uh, that gives me the, by the usual manipulations that you do if it were under an integral sign, that gives me the gravitational and Maxwell equations of motion. And normally I would have do some integration by parts and discard boundary terms to get this with all this under an integral sign. Um, but what you would get, what you get in fact in the local calculation is some exact form. Well, if I was dealing with a scalar density, this would be a total divergence. And this is the key term in developing all the machinery, this boundary term theta, which I guess symplectic potential would be the normal uh, terminology for it. This is the explicit form that you get if you do the calculation with the Einstein-Maxwell Lagrangian. And by taking a second variation, there's already a first variation, but if we take a second variation of this uh, and anti-symmetrize over the two variations, that defines a symplectic current. Uh, this is a conserved quantity. That's easy, not, e not difficult at all to show, uh, you know, if the equations of motion are satisfied, that is a direct consequence of this uh, uh, formula with the Lagrangian. Uh, and the integral of this current, which is independent of Cauchy's surface by the conservation, defines a symplectic form, which is just what you need to do Hamiltonian mechanics. And we'll get back to Hamiltonians uh, in a little while. Um, but one of the key things that you're probably at least familiar with the statement of this, when you have Lagrangians, automatically symmetries give rise to conservation laws in a sense. And you have a diffeomorphism symmetry, which is generated by some arbitrary vector field X here. And associated with that X, you can define another current associated with X by this formula. So this is just that boundary term that is just playing a key role in everything uh, that you get in varying the Lagrangian. But for the perturbation, you look at what the change under the infinitesimal diffeomorphism X generated by X is, this is Lie derivative with respect to X, phi is now all of the fields, I should have said that, in this case, the metric and the Maxwell field. And then you subtract off X dotted into the Lagrangian four form here. And with some work, you can show that this quantity takes the form of X dotted into something, the something is over here that satisfy, that vanishes when the equations of motion are satisfied, the equations of motion of this Lagrangian, uh, plus an exact form. And all these things, this is locally constructed out of the fields and the metric. So this uh, is what I call the another charge. And if the equations of motion are satisfied, so this, this is zero, then the J is exact. And in particular, DJ is zero. So that's the conservation law that you get from the diffeomorphism symmetry when the equations of motion are satisfied. But this general equation, uh, when you don't assume the equations of motion are satisfied is actually extremely uh, useful. Uh, 
this this is not the vile tensor. This is the C thing, which happens to have three, uh, four indices on it. Uh, so that's a little bit uh, confusing. But I said that vanishes when the equations of motion are satisfied, in which case this will be zero and this will be zero. But I'm actually interested in the case where I'm going to throw some matter and charge into the black hole. So the vacuum equations of motion or the electrovac equations of motion won't be satisfied in general in what I want to consider. So this thing will then involve the matter stress energy. This would be the non-electromagnetic stress energy. Uh, and this will, will be a current term that comes from the failure to satisfy the homogeneous Maxwell uh, equations. Okay, so now everything else I'm going to tell you is based on a variational identity that really only takes a few lines uh, to prove. Uh, maybe, well, this variational identity and a variation of this identity, a second variation, uh, is really underlies everything. So I get the identity that I wrote. I, it really, I maybe should have written out a view graph on this, but I don't want to spend all that much time on, you know, going through manipulations and calculations. I want to get the idea, but if you use the equality of this with this, that you can forget about the left side that defined this. If I take a variation, that is, I vary the field. I consider some one parameter family of the phi's, which are the metric and vector potential. So some parameter lambda or whatever, and I differentiate with respect to lambda. That's what I mean. I'm going to get a variation of theta, and I'm going to get a variation of the Lagrangian. For the variation of the Lagrangian, I use this equation. Uh, for the variation of the theta, I use this equation to reverse the orders of the variation and replace it with symplectic form. And here I just get variation of these constraints, you could call it, and another charge. Uh, and what I end up with, so th those terms are just copied, the rest are manipulated a bit to give this formula with the symplectic product of an arbitrary variation with a diffio variation or a gauge variation or whatever. Now, this is important because this is what plays the definition of a Hamiltonian associated with a, a vector field X. So the if you consider X, think of it as time translations uh, and this being the symplectic form, this is a disguised form of Hamilton's equations of motion. So I can, if I have a Hamiltonian, uh, it will, sat, by definition, it will satisfy uh, this equation. Now that's important because conserved quantities at infinity are defined in terms of the Hamiltonian. So, if we weren't interested in anything that, you know, about black holes or whatever, but I just wanted to define mass and angular momentum and quantities of that sort at spatial infinity in an asymptotically flat space time, uh, this is the formula I would use to define those quantities that is equivalent to the, to what Arna Witteser and Misner did. Uh, and uh, well, this is a formula for the change in the conserved quantity associated with X. Now, we'll need this as a starting point. Uh, if we have a black hole and I choose a stationary black hole and I choose X to be the horizon killing field, so this linear combination of what would be a time translation and a rotation at infinity. 
and I plug things into this formula integrated over a surface that goes from the black hole horizon to infinity. And I assume that the equations of motion of the background are satisfied. And I assume that the perturbed uh, uh, perturbation satisfies the linearized equations of motion with no sources. So this term is zero. Um, then if X is a killing field, uh, this quantity is going to be zero and the omega is going to be zero. And I'm just going to be left with this boundary term at infinity equals this boundary term at the integrated over a cross section of the horizon or the bifurcation surface of the horizon. But that boundary term at infinity is defining the conserved quantity, which if this is the killing field, that just gives me this quantity. Uh, well, I pick up uh, an electromagnetic term that I left out of the uh, uh, um, discussion here, but that depends on whether you choose the potential to vanish at infinity or the horizon or something, but you get the same term of the potential difference between infinity and the horizon. And the boundary term that you, the geometric boundary term that you get from the black hole gives you this change of area. So this variational identity gives you the first law of black hole mechanics. Okay, well, I'm not for this talk interested in deriving the first law of black hole mechanics. I wanna see what happens when you throw matter into a black hole. So let's see what happens if we start with an extremal black hole and throw matter in, I'm gonna assume that all the matter goes in so that at some later time we have a vacuum solution. And I'm gonna take this fundamental identity and uh, integrate it. Uh, so what I'm going to pick up now uh, when I don't have a vacuum solution is I'm going, I'm, I wanna know how much the mass, angular momentum and charge, he, you know, measured here, changed compared with, uh, uh, um, well, I wanna know how much the mass, angular momentum and charge of the black hole changed between here and here. Here I assume the black hole initially was unperturbed when I throw this matter in, if I take that same identity that would have given me the first law of black hole mechanics uh, and integrate that uh, uh, over this surface here, I'm just going to pick up a term involving the flux of non-electromagnetic stress energy through the horizon of the black hole. But here's where I use the fact that this satisfies the null energy condition. This is the horizon killing field. So these are both pointing in the same, uh, sorry, the X is the horizon killing field. This is the geodesic uh, affinely parametrized tangent, but these are both pointing in the K direction. This term is positive. And this is exact. This being bigger than zero is exactly what I need uh, for consistency with cosmic censorship. So this calculation generalizes the uh, you know calculation I described here with particles throwing it in. That was just for Rice and Nordstrom, but this is completely general now. Okay, but what about the non-extremal case? Uh, what happens there? Well, at leading order, at first order, you'll get this same inequality. And this, if there were no further corrections, as Hoopney originally argued, would allow you to overcharge and overspin uh, black holes. But now we want to calculate things to second order. And if you take a, a second derivative with respect to the one 
the parameter lambda of your one parameter family uh, of the identity that I had before. This identity, we take another derivative of that, taking X to be a killing field in the background, we get this equation. Well, I think I'm sufficiently running out of time that I won't attempt to walk through all of the details, but this quantity is a very interesting and useful quantity in its own right. It's the canonical energy, uh, or it has the name canonical energy, and this formula relates the canonical energy, which is uh, to these second order quantities. And in particular, this will allow us to get a important formula for the second order change in the mass if we can get information about the canonical energy. Now, to get that further information about the canonical energy, I have to assume that our initial non-extremal black hole was stable to linear perturbations, linear source-free perturbations, and therefore it will become uh, stationary at late times. Now that may sound like circular reasoning. I'm, or am I not checking the stability of these black holes? Well, I'm not checking, we're not testing the linear stability of a, a non-extremal black hole with throwing this test particle in. We're trying to see whether there's a non-linear instability if I throw in some finite amount of charge, right? I mean, or, or angular momentum. I mean, if we throw in some finite amount. So what I'm assuming here is not circular at all. It's uh, just the statement that for an infinitesimal amount of charge, I'm not gonna destroy the black hole. Of course, if I do destroy the black hole, well, that's the end of cosmic censorship, but then there's no need to think about overcharging things. We just have a black hole um, instability. Okay, if I assume that, then I have information about the canonical energy um, because the canonical energy has two contributions to it. One is from flux, which would include now gravitational energy type flux through this part of the horizon, but that we can prove is positive if the black hole becomes stationary at late times. And then a contribution here, but if it's stationary here, uh, we can compute that in terms of the Kerr-Newman, you know, the change in canonical energy that we get by changing Per Newman solution. So the flux through the horizon is positive. The contribution from this other part uh, is given by a Kerr Newman formula. What we end up with is this lower bound on the second order change of mass. And if you go through the algebra, that's exactly what you need to avoid the Hubni type counterexamples, the chain at second order, the change in mass is big enough. There's enough of a correction to uh, save you. So the conclusion is that, uh, you know, though people have tried for uh, well over now 45 years to do bad things to black holes by trying to drop or throw things in, uh, the black holes are still uh, undefeated, and in particular, you can't overcharge or overspin a black hole, uh, whether you start from the extremal black hole uh, and try to do it as I originally was considering in 1974, or you start with a slightly non-extremal black hole and try to throw things in the second order corrections to the mass, uh, defeat you, or the black hole certainly remains undefeated when you do that, uh, and you can't uh, overcharge or overspin the black hole. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the great talk. So we are perfectly on time, so we have time for questions.
well, in the, in the meantime, just to break the ice. Um, so I have a question about the, the status of the null energy condition, in the sense that the, whether, whether it's a te technical assumption that when one relaxes, I mean, it's like that is needed just to show the result, but uh, perhaps there is a way to relax it and still have the same result, or, or there is something physical on it in the sense that if you violate the, the null energy condition, then you're going to be able to overcharge. Uh, over overspun the black hole. Um, yeah, if well, if you could just blatantly violate, you know, if I gave you some matter that you know would blatantly violate uh, the null energy condition, yeah, you could do that. But you could you could vi you know violate the positive mass theorem. You could you know do all sorts of things. I mean. If I give you negative energy, uh, you can do a lot of stuff with that. But uh, uh, now, it I haven't thought about this, but it's quite possible that the average null energy condition, you know, would be sufficient. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that I mean, you certainly can find, you know, reasonable matter, I mean, conformally invariant scalar field or uh, in the quantum regime, uh, all physical matter will locally violate, you know, for brief amounts of time, uh, the null energy condition. Um, but it seems likely that the average null energy condition, uh, you know, <clears throat> yes may hold generally, there's certainly strong conjectures to that effect. And that, I think it's likely that that would be, you know, well, I haven't thought about it, but it, you know, that certainly might be sufficient. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah, I understand that sounds reasonable. And that, that was exactly my question. So thank you. We have a couple of questions, uh, one from Shinji Mugohiyama. You can unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, thank you for the very nice talk. So I have uh, again a stupid question. <laughs> so the uh, if we consider, I mean, what what do you expect uh, if we take into account the buoyancy force due to quantum fields? Probably it's okay, maybe because of average energy condition, or do you expect something different? Yeah. Well, I mean, all we're of course you know we're doing the calculation classically, so. If there were some quantum gravity effect as opposed to quantum field and curved space time, I mean, we're not, you know, we're not attempting to deal with that. Uh, but what's relevant is just what goes into the black hole, what crosses the horizon. Mm -hmm. And really all we're using about that is the null energy condition or average mm -hmm. null energy condition. So yeah, I mean, it doesn't, you know, the buoyancy type effects and things like that might prevent something that you thought was going to go into the black hole from going into the black hole. But that really, the way we're doing the analysis, that doesn't matter because we're only looking at the stuff that does go into the black hole. I see. Yes. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. We have another question from Stefano Aldebrati. Hey, thanks, Bob, for the great talk. Um, I have a question, which is uh, which is the following. Uh, exactly, if you have a null energy condition violating matter, in principle, you can also violate the area theorem. So my question for you is, is, is it possible, has anybody look at the connection? Is it possible there is a connection, a deep uh, underlying uh, uh, connection between the area theorem and the impossibility to overspin or overcharge? Um. Yeah, well, this is really, okay. I mean, this is very closely related. I mean, the the, uh, the the condition that the sort of lower bound that we're finding on delta M squared, I mean, so we could do this calculation far from extremality. We're not assuming anywhere in the calculation. And this is really just the condition that 
at second order, the area will still increase. Uh, I mean, at first order, the, you know, if you go back to this inequality, um, this is in fact exactly saying that at first order, the area uh, cannot, given that this is positive, the area cannot decrease. But if this were zero, then you could make a change which at first order would not change the area. Our more general inequality is saying that if you didn't change the area at first order, this uh, inequality is just what, again, with this being non-negative, is uh, just what you need to make sure that you don't decrease the area at second order either. So they are very closely related. And, I see. and yeah. Well, wow, this is a very interesting, I mean, it's a very nice connection, I think. Yeah. Thank you. So one last question from Gustavo Melgarejo. If you are there, you can, you can let me just, how you should be able to unmute yourself so that you can ask the question. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my question is related. Uh, if I, uh, if a charged particle fall in a Schwarzschild black hole, it, uh, that black hole uh, to become in a rational neutron, is possible to to model that transformation uh, like a, as a, a phase transition, or yes. Uh, sorry, uh, I think you'll have to, I don't think I caught the question. You might have to repeat it and maybe even elucidate it. Uh, okay, okay. If, uh, if a charged particle uh, fall into a Schwarzschild black hole, yeah. uh, called the result uh, is a Reisner Nostrum black hole, no? Okay. It is possible to model it as a fast transition, that transformation of a Schwarzschild black hole into a Claisen nostrum. Uh, did you say phase transition? I, I'm not sure I understood the word. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I, no, I wouldn't. I don't. There, there's nothing, uh, you know, dramatic that's changing when the, you know, Schwarzschild black hole is getting a little bit of charge and becoming a Rice and Nordstrom black hole. I mean, it's a completely continuous change. There's no, you know, discontinuous change in any of the properties or even, you know, in derivatives. I mean, it's not, a, so I wouldn't, uh, I don't think it would be useful to think of it as a phase transition. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you again for the nice talk. We are